Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tippy Women's Summit. This is our webinar series today, and this is actually our final event in the Tippy Women's Summit series. My name is Barbara Thomas, and I am the Executive Director of Communications and Alumni Relations here at the Tippy College of Business. So historically, for those of you who may not know, the Tippy Women's Summit is traditionally actually held in person here in Iowa City. But as all of us had to do in the time of COVID, we have pivoted and this year we actually chose to instead provide virtual programming to you throughout the month of March, kind of in correlation with Women's History Month. So we hope that you've been able to enjoy some of the events that we have, but don't worry, if you miss some of them, they are all available on the Tippy College's YouTube page. So I am excited today to have Anna Tunnicliffe with us today. She is from the Iowa Women's Archives, and she's curated this presentation specifically for the Tippy Women's Summit. And she will be talking today about women who have shaped the University of Iowa. Now soon I will introduce our Dean, Amy Christoph Brown, but before we do so, I do want to mention a few other events and just give you a few little tips before we start today's event. So our next Tibby webinar with faculty will take place on Wednesday, April 14th. Stephen Courtright will share a presentation on toxic leadership and how to address it. In addition, we'll be holding a business of real estate panel that will happen in the month of May. Date is yet to be set, but please watch for that information as well. And lastly, we have just added an additional career webinar that will happen on April 28th. And in that session, we'll be talking about Handshake. Handshake is a job search tool that is heavily used by University of Iowa students, but it is actually available to University of Iowa alumni as well. And in this webinar, we'll talk about what Handshake is, how you can get an account, as well as how you can search for jobs that are beyond entry level. So any of these events, there's information always on the Tippy College's alumni webpage, which is just tippy.uiowa.edu slash alumni. Now, before we begin, just a few things about this event. We're actually in a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So you've probably noticed that your microphone and your camera are automatically muted. In addition, you have probably noticed that we have activated the live transcription for this for the people who have need some assistance with hearing. And so you do have the option to turn off that feature and I'm going to just talk you through that. So at the bottom of your button, you probably see a button for more with three dots. If you click on that button, you will have the option to hide subtitles. Now, if you like the subtitles, but you'd like them to be a bit larger, go to that same button and choose subtitle settings, and then you can actually change the size of the subtitles. You'll also notice that there is a button for chat as well as for Q&A, and they're actually two different things. And so in the chat, you have the ability to send a message to all panelists or to all panelists and everyone you do not have the ability to chat with each other. However, what we'd ask is that if you have a question for our speaker today, we ask that you click on the Q&A button, type in your question and hit answer or hit return, and then we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the presentation. So with that, I want to make sure that you know, one, we are recording this event and it will be available on our YouTube page. Um, and we invite you to please share and invite anyone you know to our webinars. All of our webinars are open to the public. We just ask that you have them register. That gives us better data on who is attending our events, and we would greatly appreciate it if you could do that. But again, anyone you know that might be interested in the topic or the speaker, please feel free to share that information. So next, I'd like to introduce our Dean, Amy Christoph Brown. Now, Amy is a highly respected faculty member and researcher, and she's been at the Tippy College for some time. In March of 2020, she was named the interim dean of the college, and then, you know, life became a little different for all of us, and she has led the college with great style, grace, and compassion. 
so much so that in December of 2020, she was officially named the Dean of the Tibby College of SS. And now I will turn it over to Amy. Amy? Thanks so much, Barb. I'm always glad that, uh, that you say such nice things in the introduction and you didn't refer to uh, Steve's webinar on toxic bosses. I think that's uh, <laughs> always something I'm a little bit nervous about. But I just wanna say, um, first of all, welcome to everybody who's here with us today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I know many of you have probably been to some of our earlier webinars. Uh, I've been attending every single one of them and I wanna say a huge thank you uh, to Barb Thomas and Ashley Durham, who are our amazing alumni relations uh, team in the Tippy College who put together such a fantastic slate of programming. So if we were in a live room, we would all be clapping now and thanking you for all of the work that went into this uh, because it's just been terrific. There's been an event uh, at least once a week over the last month, really fantastic topics ranging from mental health during the pandemic, women in STEM, women on corporate boards, and now today, women who shaped the University of Iowa. So thank you, Barb and Ashley, for putting this together. Um, this has been a terrific set of, of programming that we have. As Barb mentioned, you can access any of our prior webinars on our YouTube channel, and we would encourage you to do that. Now, I don't want to take any more time from Anna today, so I'm happy to introduce Anna Tonicliffe. She's an Iowa woman herself. She received a BA in history from Augustana College and then completed her master's degree at the University of Iowa's School of Library and Information Science. Anna started working in the Iowa Women's Archives, which she'll talk a little bit about today, as a graduate research assistant. And upon her graduation, we kept her by starting her working full-time as the archives processing librarian. Uh, truth that when we get great women here, we try and keep them. Anna is passionate about her role with the Iowa Women's Archives and really enjoys introducing students to the archives and helping them feel comfortable with the role of primary source research. When a student researcher finds a collection in the IWA that sparks his or her interests or fits their projects, it really lights up her day. And I am very much looking forward to hearing what she has to tell us today about the women who have shaped the history at the University of Iowa. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure to be working with the Tippy College of Business this month as uh, we get ready for this final event in the Tippy Women's Summit. Um, as you just heard, I'm Anna Tunnicliffe and I'm from the Iowa Women's Archives. It's a unit within the University of Iowa Library's Special Collections and Archives that focuses on preserving the history of Iowa's women. This presentation will have two parts. The first section will cover the Iowa Women's Archives, how it came to be, how we fulfill our mission, and the second section will focus on four women, Mae Broadbeck, Christine Grant, Rusty Barcelo, and Susan Buckley, whose administrative leadership changed the University of Iowa and made it a better place to work and study. The University of Iowa owes a lot to its women. You can see this reflected in some of the buildings. Halsey Hall, just up the street from the IMU, was named for Elizabeth Halsey, the first director of women's physical education. Another more recent building, Catlett Hall, the newest and largest residence hall on campus, is named for world-renowned sculptor and University of Iowa graduate, Elizabeth Catlett. Since the University of Iowa became the first public university to admit women on an equal basis with men in 1855, it has produced many notable women graduates, faculty, and eventually administrators. Mildred Wirt Benson, who originated the character of Nancy Drew, was also the first person to graduate with a master's in journalism from the University of Iowa back in the 1920s. And Marion Reese, who maybe should have been in business, graduated from the university in 1951 with a degree in sociology and went to Hollywood. In 1981, she founded her own production company, Marion Reese Associates. Her films went on to win 11 Emmys and two Golden Globes. And you can see her here with an excellent dog. These past two examples of extraordinary women who attended the University of Iowa came from the collections at the Iowa Women's Archives. At the IWA, we have over 1,200 collections. These women, in our collections may not all have buildings named after them, but nonetheless influenced our campus and our state. 
So you can see the Iowa Women's Archives. This is our reading room. So how did we come to have all these collections? And how did the University of Iowa get a women's archives? Because it's kind of unusual. Well, the story starts back in the 1960s when Louise Noun, who you can see on the right, an independent historian from Des Moines, started writing a book about suffrage in Iowa. Noun earned an MA from Harvard in art history in 1933. Her advisor suggested that she return home and get married instead of pursuing a career. She did that, but she also volunteered in the League of Women Voters, NOW, and the Iowa Women's Political Caucus. Now knew that Iowa history was full of politically active women like herself. Her own mother had been a suffragist and she wanted to write their history. When Noun started looking around Iowa for resources on the women who shaped our state, she couldn't find them. She ended up at the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe College, one of the few institutions that had been prioritizing the collection of women's history. During this experience, Noun decided that Iowa should also have a women's archives. Her book, Strong-Minded Women, The Emergence of the Woman's Suffrage Movement in Iowa, was published in 1969, but it would take a couple more decades before Noun's vision of the Iowa Women's Archives came true. For that to happen, she needed to team up with another Iowa feminist who you may or may not have heard of, Mary Louise Smith, and you can see her right there standing next to Louise. Smith came from Eagle Grove, Iowa, which is where she got involved in politics, working for the Republican Party. When Smith started out, the party had a separate structure of vice chairs and committee women who oversaw the groundwork for Republicans' women's clubs and young Republicans. This guaranteed that women would have leadership positions within the party without access to the largest seats of power. Then in 1974, Mary Louise was named the first woman chair of the National Republican Committee, making national history. She was a woman who knew how to make change. When her friend Louise Noun said she'd been trying to get a women's archive started without gaining traction, Smith knew that she could help. Smith asked the university's then president, Hunter Rawlings, to commit to an Iowa women's archives. He thought it was a great idea, but the project needed money. Noun stepped in with an idea. Her background in art history had inspired her to collect artwork by women. She had in her possession an original Frida Kahlo painting self-portrait with loose hair. And there it is. In 1991, this was auctioned at Christie's for $1.65 million. The proceeds were used to endow the Iowa Women's Archives in 1992. Some people think that collecting the papers of Iowa women might be limiting, but any Iowan knows there's a lot more to our state than people think. For us, any woman who was born, educated, or moved here counts as an Iowa woman. Because of this, IWA's collections extend all over the world with papers of immigrants, missionaries, and many other world-traveling women. Women also have a lot of men in their lives, so the collections of IWA also reflect their experiences. We even have the papers of a few men whose activities intersected with women's rights in their communities. The IWA prioritized collecting initiatives that added to our diversity in the repository that would truly reflect Iowa's women. We've had special projects focused on African-Americans, Latinas, rural women, and Jewish women. In the meantime, we built additional strengths in women in politics, um, women's athletics, and LGBTQ issues. We currently have nearly 1,200 collections available for researchers to use that cover women's experiences from the 19th century to just a few years ago. These manuscript collections are made up of a unique combination of papers and artifacts, materials generated by the everyday lives of women who donated them. In a box in the IWA, you might find the meeting minutes of a women's studies club, a farm account book, pictures from a dance recital, or a cherished college scrapbook. Each of these items were special to the women who donated them, and at the archives, we do everything we can to preserve them. Now, some of you might be thinking, all this talk about preserving women's history sounds great, but what does that mean in a practical way? 
It all starts with donations from people like you or your mothers or grandmothers. Sometimes there are just a few items. Other times there are hundreds of boxes. You can see here all of the processed collections in just one aisle of the archives. There are thousands of boxes. When a new collection comes in, our staff, you can see me here from 2015, <laughs> starts getting them ready for researchers by arranging and describing the collection and putting that description online. This is the crux of our work in the archives. The more collections we process, the easier it is for students and scholars to use and access our materials. I'm happy to report that our materials get a lot of use. Since I started working here in 2015, we've hosted classes for departments as diverse as Spanish and dance. We've loaned art work to a museum in Dubuque, and we hosted a birthday party for a 90-year-old man whose mother's papers were held in the archives. IWA collections have enriched dissertations, inspired published works, and even shown up on television. Recently, images from the IWA made it into a Black History Month video produced by the city of Iowa City. The video focused on Betty Tate and other Black community members who stepped in to provide housing for Black students when they were not allowed to live in campus housing. Although Black students had been allowed at the university since the 1870s, they couldn't live in campus housing until 1945. Tate and her husband Bud's large home, aka Tate Arms, filled this need until 1961, when more off-campus landlords finally started leasing to Black students. I hope examples like this illustrate for you the types of things that the Iowa Women's Archives has and the surprising ways that they pop up around the state. At this point, I'll pivot from talking about archives to talking about specific women whose papers are in the archives. To me, they're all celebrities, but plenty of people in Iowa haven't heard of them, even the women whose work has changed our state. The rest of this presentation will be dedicated to four women whose work has changed the University of Iowa and the way students, faculty, and staff experience the campus. Mae Broadbeck, Christine Grant, Rusty Barcelo, and Sue Buckley. From each of these women, I hope you can learn something new and exciting, maybe something that even changes the way you think about UI. So let's go back nearly 50 years to 1974 when Iowa made a nationally important hire. Mae Broadbeck, became the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculties. At the time, this was the highest academic position held by a woman outside of women's only institutions in the entire country. There's Iowa leading the way. Broadbeck was a gifted academic with proven administrative experience and she would leave her mark here. In the 1940s, Broadbeck became something rather unusual at the time, a woman in the sciences. After a brief career teaching high school chemistry, she re-entered academia and worked as a junior physicist on the Manhattan Project before earning her master's and PhD from the University of Iowa in 1945 and 1947, respectively. Here, she found her niche, the philosophy of science. She would have been only one of a handful of women pursuing this course at the time. According to a National Science Foundation report from 2006, Women received only 27% of doctorate degrees from 1920 to 1999, and 43% of those were issued in the 1990s. Women who did achieve postgraduate degrees faced diminished job prospects, much as IWA's founder Louise Naum had discovered after being discouraged from her, by her own advisor from pursuing a career. But Broadbeck's time at the university launched her into an academic career. Against the odds, she became an instructor of philosophy at the University of Minnesota just months after graduating. She attributed some of this to the luck of timing. She'd been able to study during World War II when many men who might have been in school were fighting overseas. Afterward, she said, quote, the country was bulging with returning veterans in 1947 and schools all over the country needed people to teach. Although she didn't see her sex as having hurt her job prospects, she was the only woman in her department for nearly 20 years. Besides teaching, Broadbeck distinguished herself as a potential administrator. She studied on Fulbright grants in Italy, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden, chaired the University Senate Committee on Educational Policy, and headed her department from 1967 to 1970. 
she rose to prominence in the Western Division of the American Philosophical Association by serving as president in 1972. Also in 1972, her administrative career took off when she replaced Bryce Crawford as Dean of the Graduate School. In his letter to Broadbeck, Crawford described the job as the best administrative position in the university. Broadbeck's appointment was applauded. The Minneapolis Tribune wrote that it indicated, quote, the university's readiness to make up for past injustices and to recognize women as well as men on their merits. We hope there are many more such indications to come. That's a statement I feel that I could still read in the papers today. After just two years as Dean at the University of Minnesota, Broadbeck returned to her alma mater as Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculties. One of the thickest folders in her papers is filled with congratulations, but also sorrow at her leaving Minnesota after so long. Her colleague Jasper Hoskins wrote to her and acknowledged how important a position this is. And I can also sense something of what it must mean to you to return to your alma mater. And the University of Iowa campus was excited to have her. Early in her first semester, she was interviewed for the local press citizen as the first woman vice president at the University of Iowa. Comparing the town and the campus to how she found it as a student, Broadbeck stated, there are so many new things, yet so many familiar ones as well. The university has expanded. There are more buildings. I like Iowa City and I liked it then. But the campus had changed since the late 1940s, of course, in several ways, specifically benefiting women. Not only were there more women students at the university in the 1970s, but thanks to their activism, their needs, interests, and history were getting more attention. The university had recently opened what would become the Women's Resource and Action Center and the Action Studies Program, which pioneered classes in previously under-recognized areas of study, were holding classes and poetry readings about women's issues. It was an exciting time, and May Broadbeck's legacy is based in large part on her support of women on campus. Early on in her time at the University of Iowa, May Broadbeck officially established a women's studies program. She also organized the University of Iowa's Council on the Status of Women in 1976. This council, which was meant to focus on the needs and welfare of women at the university, particularly those working here, was part of a movement of such councils in the state. Iowa governors Harold Hughes and Robert Ray had both established commissions on the status of women in the 1960s, and the Iowa legislature formally created a permanent Iowa Commission on the Status of Women in 1972. The University of Iowa's came on the heels of the International Women's Year program in 1975, which focused on women's education and employment. The council would have a similar focus. In, in a 1976 Daily Iowan article, May Broadbeck spoke generally about the council. Quote, the committee will have a positive function in developing a climate on campus that will promote situations that help women. She added that it has a way of making it known to the UI president what could be improved that would aid the welfare of women. Initial examples of what the council would do focused on the availability of childcare. For example, providing rooms with toys and staff to care for children while their mothers attended academic conferences. Over the years, the Council on the Status of Women, which still exists today at the university, has tackled parenting concerns and childcare, sexual harassment, and affirmative action on campus. Current subcommittees include studying the experiences of women of color, pay equity, and Title IX. Broadbeck retired from the University of Iowa in 1983 and very shortly thereafter passed away. Her death spawned several tributes and memorials from the University of Iowa, but perhaps her most enduring legacy is the Council on the Status of Women. Each year at the Council's celebration of excellence and achievement among women, one University of Iowa faculty member is awarded the May Broadbeck Distinguished Achievement Award. This award's description states, Broadbeck provided inspiration and effective leadership in a period of enormous faculty growth and intellectual ferment. She expanded the program of faculty developmental leaves, placed the women's studies program on a firm footing, and in general, improved the place of women in the academic world by example, by encouragement, and by administrative achievement. May Broadbeck was the highest ranking woman at the University of Iowa, but certainly wasn't the only one in administration. 
When she arrived in 1974, Christine Grant had already been serving as the university's first athletic director of the Department of Women's Athletics for about a year. If you're a Hawkeye fan, Christine Grant is a name you may already know. Her work here from 1973 to 2003 changed the lives of all women athletes at the University of Iowa. It also had a national impact. Christine Grant was born a long way from Iowa in Scotland. She studied physical education there before heading to Canada to coach field hockey. She spent most of the 1960s in British Columbia and Ontario, honing her administrative skills by organizing field hockey tournaments. By the late 1960s, she decided to return to school and chose Iowa City for her master's and PhD. Why would a woman from Scotland with a career in Canada choose Iowa of all places to study physical education, you might ask? Well, the University of Iowa had a Department of Physical Education for Women and had since 1924. The first woman to run it was Elizabeth Halsey. Remember Halsey Hall? That's her. The department offered graduate study and professional training for women like Grant. Its first PhD graduate was M. Gladys Scott, who finished her degree in 1937 and chaired the department from 1955 to 1974. In a 2001 article in the NCAA News, Grant attributed her choice to Dr. Scott and the reputation of the program. She said, Dr. Gladys Scott, who is regarded by some as the mother of biomechanics, was chair for the department and her book, An Analysis of Human Motion, was used quite widely. So Grant moved to Iowa City in 1969 with no intention to stay after her degree was finished. But things were changing quickly for women in the 1970s and Grant's plans changed as well. Title IX passed through Congress in 1972. It prohibited sex-based discrimination in any school or other education program that receives federal money. It was meant to affect schools broadly, and it does, but it's most widely known for its impact on sports. Suddenly, schools like the University of Iowa had to offer athletic opportunities for women that had previously been mostly or all for men. In 1973, the University of Iowa decided to act and establish varsity women's sports at the university and create a position to manage the program. Dr. Gladys Scott asked Grant, then finishing her dissertation to apply. She got the job. It's easy for women who grew up with sports in school and the possibility of athletic scholarships to forget how things had been before Title IX, but they were dramatically different. One of Grant's immediate problems was that women weren't allowed in the field house where varsity athletes practiced and played. After that was worked out, there were still questions of funding, space, and equipment. Grant recalled the struggles of the fledgling department in a 1999 interview. She said, when I accepted the job, my office was a corner of the kitchen in Halsey Gymnasium. The PE secretary used to phone down to my office every morning and say, would you put the soup on please? Furthermore, there was a shortage of uniforms, only two sets to be shared by 12 teams that played a variety of sports from field hockey to basketball. The swim team had to provide their own bathing suits. When the teams traveled, they didn't have money for accommodations and sometimes they had to sleep on gym floors. So in the 1970s, women finally had varsity sports, but it wasn't quite what the men had at the time. In a 2001 article, Grant remembered, quote, we had 10 balls in the air simultaneously, but it was all so exciting. You had to work very, very long hours in order to get anything done that you needed to get done with no support personnel, with graduate school, graduate students often as head coaches, and back then, no assistant coaches, no athletic scholarships, end quote. Despite the setbacks, in one year, Grant turned 12 club sports into varsity teams. Athletic scholarships began for women shortly after that. As if that weren't enough, she had a hand in how women's athletics would be organized at the university and national levels. Christine Grant was a consultant for the task force in the Department of Health, Education and Welfare's Civil Rights Office, focused on defining Title IX compliance. That meant that while she was working on sports at Iowa, she was traveling, helping to put together the report that would try to turn the initially vague and ambiguous Title IX into achievable goals. What Grant's experience here meant to the University of Iowa cannot be underestimated. She put our university at a distinct advantage when it came to compliance and opportunities for student athletes. 
During this time, UI was also a charter member of the fledgling Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, AIAW. The AIAW emphasized a less commercially driven idea of intercollegiate competition and initially even forbade scholarships and off-campus recruiting so as not to give some programs an unfair advantage. This changed in 1974 when programs began offering scholarships to female student athletes. The organization put together regional and national tournaments for women's athletics. Iowa hosted a tennis tournament in 1979 and by 1980, the AIAW was hosting tournaments for 41 different sports. That year, Christine Grant served as president of the organization. Grant headed the Department of Women's Athletics at Iowa through the year 2000. In addition to her demanding job, she promoted gender equity everywhere she could. She gave speeches everywhere from the NCAA and Big Ten events to YWCA's and the Iowa City Rotary Club. She also testified as an expert witness in several Title IX related lawsuits and governmental hearings. Some pieces of Grant's legacy haven't remained intact. As the interest and potential profit in women's collegiate athletics grew, the NCAA chose to allow women's competition for Division I, II, III, I, II, and III teams starting in the 1980s. Despite the AIAW's best efforts, schools began dropping out, television contracts were lost, and the group folded in 1983 as women's athletics were officially absorbed by the NCAA. Additionally, the University of Iowa's Department for Women that Women's Athletics no longer exists. Women and men's athletics departments were merged in 2000, the same year that Christine Grant retired. And of course, the application of Title IX in women's athletics has never been perfect. However, though some institutions she worked within no longer exist, Grant's legacy continues with every women's varsity game played at Iowa. There is no doubt that our women's athletes would have a different experience today had the University of Iowa not had a talented leader like Grant at the helm, recruiting and retaining talented coaches and athletes and advocating for women's equity nationally. You can see that others recognized her contributions by her numerous awards, she won the Billie Jean King Award from the Women's Sports Foundation and was inducted into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame in 2006. An honor that I'm sure was very special to her came in 1991 when the University of Iowa named their field hockey field after her. Hawkeyes today can still play at the Grant Field, enjoying the same sport that set Dr. Christine Grant on an incredible career in women's athletics. Like Christine Grant, Nancy V. Rusty Barcelo came to the University of Iowa as a graduate student in 1969. Barcelo had received a degree in social welfare and corrections from Chico State University. She was one of very few Chicanas on campus. The university's Equal Opportunity Office estimated that in 1970, there were only 22 Chicanos and 14 American Indians at the University of Iowa out of 20,000 students. That's a lonely position to be in. Barcelo would dedicate her career at the University of Iowa to recruiting and retaining more students from underrepresented groups and creating spaces on campus where Latinx students could feel more at home. Barcelo earned a master's degree at the University of Iowa in recreational education in 1972 and then left for two years to work in Oregon before returning to the University of Iowa to study for a PhD. In 1980, she became the first Chicana to earn a doctoral degree from UI. In her time as a student, she had few people to connect with who shared her cultural background, but she didn't sublimate who she was to try to fit into a majority white campus. In a 2003 oral history interview for the Women's Resource and Action Center, Barcelo recalled, quote, the reason I got through Iowa as the only Chicana is because I embraced my Chicana identity. I didn't let anybody take that away from me. I would not have made it otherwise. I'm convinced of that, end quote. And she didn't just make it. She paved the way for others to make it too. In 1971, Barcelo, along with Antonio Zavala and Ruth Pushatanaka, founded the Chicano and Indian American Cultural Center, today known as the Latino and Native American Cultural Center, or LMAC. 
Before I get too far into the center and Barcelo's career, I'd like to mention that for this section, I used not only Barcelo's papers in the Iowa Women's Archives, but a current exhibit at the UI Main Library. Building Our Own Community, 50 Years of the Latino Native American Cultural Center founded by Chicano and American Indian students in 1971, was curated by two UI librarians, Christopher Ortega and Rachel Garza Carrion. The exhibit covers the history of LNAC from the 1970s to today and includes materials from the LNAC records at the University Archives. It will be on display until June 5th, June 25th, 2021, and will soon have videos online for offsite users. Along with her fellow founders, Barcelo planned for LNAC to be a home base for Chicano and Native American students and a platform from which their representation on campus would grow. The Elnac House on Clinton Street, which later moved to Melrose in 1973, offered familiar food, music, and community for Latinx and Native American students, a place where they would feel comfortable. In the very beginning, it also attempted to recruit more students by hosting events in Davenport and Tama, Iowa, where there were sizable Mexican Americans and Meskwaki communities. These efforts put pressure on the university and were likely part of the reason that Latino and Native American student populations began to increase. During LNAC's first decade when it was getting off the ground, Barcelo worked in various capacities for the Office of Academic Affairs, including the Equal Opportunities Program and the Office of Affirmative Action. In 1982, she became the interim director of the Affirmative Action Office. Until 1996, she remained at the University of Iowa, working to bring more students of color to the university and create a campus culture where they felt welcomed and valued, most notably through her various positions in the program Opportunity at Iowa. Barcelo also worked to build bridges to other areas on campus. Starting in the 1970s, she pushed the Women's Resource and Action Center, also known as RAC, to be more intersectional. In a 2003 interview, she recalled working with then director Linda McGuire to get women of color to participate in RAC, starting with race and interpersonal workshops with a member of the campus's black community, Marcella Benson. She recalled that over time, RAC became an advocate and friend of the cultural centers on campus and diversified their own staff. But it didn't come without continuous work and outreach from a multi-ethnic coalition. In her interview, Barcelo recalled there were a group of group of women of color who felt that, quote, we value the services and the direction that RAC was going for white women, but we felt that we needed to work with RAC to try to make it more accessible to women of color, end quote. These early conversations became the seeds of the Women Against Racism Committee, which was housed within RAC in the 1980s. The work, this committee, the work of this committee peaked in 1989 with the Parallels and Intersection Conference, which attracted more than 1,500 people to the University of Iowa. Rusty Barcelo left the University of Iowa professionally in 1996, but she continues to be involved. Here at the Iowa Women's Archives, Barcelo's support has helped us to fund and prioritize the Mujeres Latinas Project, which has collected over 100 oral histories of Latinas across Iowa. Since I've been in the archives, the Latina Legacy Fund, which she initiated, has funded opportunities for students like Lupita Larios, who process Latina collections and transcribe interviews in Spanish. In building our community, there is a quote by Rusty Barcelo on the wall. Quote, one of the things I tell students is that there are many students who came before you to make your path smoother. And I would ask students, what legacy will you leave behind for those students who follow you to make their paths easier, end quote. Part of Barcelo's legacy, LNAC, continues to be a force on campus, hosting an annual powwow, promoting and sponsoring activities for Latinx Heritage Month, and continuously pushing the university to do better. The library's current exhibit features the recent Twitter campaign, hashtag Does Iowa Love Me, in which students, including those involved in LNAC, called out the university for the lack of support for students of color and incidents of racism experienced on campus. The activism of today's students fits in precisely with the legacy of Rusty Barcelo, who knew that when it comes to combating racism and bias, the work isn't ever really done. Susan Buckley was supposed to start a PhD program in Toronto in the fall of 1974, 
but after visiting Iowa City at the end of a long hitchhiking trip, she decided to stay here instead. Part of what attracted her, her to the city was its vibrant, creative, and politically active women's community. Buckley would spend her nearly 40-year career at Iowa, building on these structures and advocating for human rights, eventually retiring as Vice President of Human Resources in 2009. In the 1970s, Buckley worked as facilities coordinator for the women's athletics program and as a coordinator for the action studies program that piloted classes in areas like African-American and women's studies while those programs were just taking off. With a group of concerned citizens, she also pushed to change the human rights policy of the city and the university to include protections for people of all sexual orientations. The university did update the policy in 1985. Around the same time, Buckley also became involved in the Women's Resource and Action Center by coaching the softball team and contributing to the newsletter of the Lesbian Alliance, a group based within RAC. In the early 1980s, on top of everything, she joined the Council on the Status of Women. By 1983, Susan Buckley had become the full-time director of RAC. RAC was founded to be a cultural, social, and organizational center for UI women. I imagine some of you may remember its old location on Market Street, or if you graduated recently, its new one on North Clinton Street. In the 1980s, running RAC meant overseeing the many women's organizations that at one time or another called the building home. These included at the time, the Lesbian Alliance, also the Rape Victim Advocacy Program, and the Women Against Racism Committee, which Rusty Barslow had helped to found. Buckley would continue to move through administrative positions, Land, landing in human resources sometime in the 1990s, an office that was perhaps an ideal position from which she could progress human rights at the university. It was around this time in the late 1980s that Buckley began collecting research on domestic partner benefits. A 1987 information sheet from the city of Berkeley, California, stated that domestic partner benefits were an attempt to try to equalize employment benefits between married couples and couples who are not married, either through choice or because they are barred from marriage, as in the case of lesbian or gay couples. As a lesbian herself, the change in the university policy would personally affect her, but through her work on the university's human rights committee, she knew too that it would also affect the estimated 3,000 lesbians and gay men employed or enrolled at the university by 1990. By the sheer amount of material Buckley saved on the subject, it was clear that she was an especially involved advocate for this change. A 1990 survey by the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force uncovered a patchwork of LGBTQ friendly policies at a small number of campuses, mostly to do with housing. Not one school offered medical or dental insurance to same sex partners. Buckley wanted to change that. She made allies on campus and saved a significant amount of documentation about the struggle. In 1989, she wrote a letter to the legal director of Lambda's Legal Defense and Education Fund and asked for educational materials on domestic partnership rights. She stated her intent, quote, presently I am trying to facilitate the adoption of a new personnel policy at the University of Iowa that would allow health insurance policies by the partners of lesbian and gay men employees. Interestingly, there is some significant support for this change. However, as you know, this is a very uphill and very long process. It is clear that the members of a crucial committee dealing with this policy need to be educated. Why policies like this are affirmative and why all hell won't break loose in terms of abuses financially, et cetera, end quote. The resulting packet she forwarded to the Funded Retirement and Insurance Committee and Mary Jo Small, the Vice President for Finance and University Services. Small would become a vocal advocate for the change, quoted in several articles discussing it through the early 1990s. By 1992, a new insurance plan at the University of Iowa was on the table. It would, according to a local supportive editorial, allow faculty and staff to enroll their domestic partners in the high deductible insurance program as part of a three-year trial, and would, quote, put UI on the map in terms of treating all employees well, end quote. In 1993, UI put itself at the forefront, offering coverage to domestic partners of faculty and staff when it was nearly unheard of on college campuses. However, the change didn't exactly equal equality. 
as the university didn't contribute to the cost of any of the fringe benefits same-sex partners could access, like they did for heterosexual married couples. Between the years 1998 and 2000, Susan Buckley, an assistant director of human resources, was part of in-depth and technical talks with the Funded Retirement and Insurance Committee about how the university could solidify its support of same-sex partner benefits. The work wasn't glamorous. Lots of talk about budgets, tax laws, flex benefits. But the conversations were necessary. In January 2001, with the support of the university president, the entire staff council, and many others, the University of Iowa finally expanded their benefits for registered domestic partners, equivalent to what a spouse would receive under either the employee, spouse, or employee faculty category. Because of the behind the scenes dedication of people like Susan Buckley, the University of Iowa has been able to continually make improvements on its dedication to providing a just campus. Buckley was involved not only in improving the university's human rights statement and making domestic partner benefits a reality. She was president of the staff council from 1990 to 1991. She served on the Rainbow Project Task Force in 1997 that explored issues of LGBTQ members of UIowa's community. Her time on the Council for the Status of Women included deep dives into affirmative action, sexual harassment, and equal pay. For her work, Buckley was awarded the Jean Ju Women's Rights Award in 1993, the Board of Regents Staff Excellence Award in 1998, and the Christine Wilson Medal for Justice and Equality in 2005. In 2015, the University of Iowa's Committee on the Celebration of Excellence and Achievement Among Women renamed their Distinguished Achievement Award for Staff in her honor. Well, I suppose I've talked enough, so I'll try to make my conclusion short. Picking just a few women to talk about was so hard, and each woman's story revealed even more women, all working together to create a campus that paid attention to and valued women's contributions. Have we reached full equality? Most women will tell you, not yet. But as we continue to push forward, it's helpful to think about the women who, became, who came before us and reflect on how far we've come. Thank you for coming today and I look forward to your questions. Feel free to contact me. Great, thank you so much, Anna. And I think everybody should know that her contact information is on that slide there, if you would like to reach out to her. We do have a couple of questions and I wanna remind people that you can use the Q&A button to do that. Um, I think this is definitely an interesting question. Um, what is the criteria for the archives? And then I'd like to follow that up with if someone has content, if they have materials that they think might be valuable for the women's archives, what can they do to get those materials um, to you or to the archives? Sure. Well, technically, our um, bar is that uh, we're looking for the papers of Iowa women, and that that can mean someone who was born here, educated here, moved here. You just have to have a connection to Iowa. Um, we do have collecting priorities. There are some things that we maybe already have a lot of and we're not looking to collect right now. Um, so if you have something that you think might be um, appropriate for our repository, you can email our reference account at lib-women at uiowa.edu, and I can put that in the chat. Um, so you can feel free to contact us, and if it's not appropriate for the Women's Archives, maybe we can suggest another repository that we think um, would be a good place. Perfect. Well, I would guess that there is some content out there. Um, oh, I'm even sure. wondering, I know Miss Nancy Hauserman, she has done quite a bit in her day with our university and she probably has kind of a, some great content that should be included as well. That's a very familiar name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll at Tippy too because we love that woman. Um, so another question, do you capture the community impact made by the women in the archives? I think to some extent that sort of thing comes up in the papers that we receive. A lot of what I was um, quoting from today were from newspaper articles that people saved. And those are the kinds of things that are, you know, saved by the community or by the woman from the community. 
we also collect the organizational records of the sorts of places that they established. And some of those are things that are still in existence today, like RAC, uh, like the Council of the Status on Women. And some of them are um, things that are no longer, no longer here. Um, you know, we have some materials in various collections on a women's coffee shop that used to exist in Iowa City or a women's bookstore. Great. Well, and I think, you know, I encourage any of our viewers look through this chat that is happening as well, because there's a lot of other interesting names that we are hearing about, you know, Jean Ju, T. Mm -hmm. Ann Cleary, you know, there are a lot of women and you have kind of hit that, you know, the tip of the iceberg, let's say, uh, but there has got to be a lot of other content that is oh, yes. uh, we, we in do the archive. The T. Ann Cleary papers and the records of the Jean Ju Justice Committee. So, you know, anything that you're interested in, a lot of times people come to us with things that they don't think are gonna be at the Iowa Women's Archives, but we have a collection that touches on it. Great. So we have another question that asks if there is a website that would show the various campus initiatives kind of related to women and human rights mm. underway that, so that people who might be interested in volunteering or getting more involved, if you are aware of that, and you may or may not in your role with the archives. I would check um, at the websites of RAC for things that are specifically related to, to students. And I would also check with the Council on the Status of Women. Those, those would both be good places to look. And um, you know, the Celebration of Excellence and Achievement Among Women also has a committee and their event will be next week. So yeah, I, I would knock on the door of some of those offices and see if we have a total list of what's currently going on. Gotcha. And you know, I want to thank you for that reminder that so it is April 7th next week is the event for the Celebration of Excellence and Achievement Among Women. It will be held from 5 to 7 p.m. and it is virtual. So it's super easy for people to attend. I just put the link in. So uh, if you are interested, please make sure that you go there and kind of check that out. Now, I love this next question. What is one of the most surprising things or items that you have ever received in the Iowa Women's Archive? Oh my goodness. Oh, isn't that a good one? <laughs> surprising things. Um, well, there are the silly things. I, I found somebody's baby doll stuffed in a bread bag once. I wasn't expecting that to be in there. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the cooler things I've come across recently, I just um, processed last year the Mary Bywater Cross papers and she's from a family that had been in Iowa for a long time. Her father owned an advertising business here in Iowa City, but she'd done a lot of, she had a lot of family history. And I looked in there and I found a letter from the like mid 1800s when her family first came to Dubuque and they're writing about what Iowa was like over a hundred years ago. And, you know, we don't, Iowa is not a super old, you know, state and it was very different in the 1850s. So that was, I think something really special that I wasn't expecting. Gotcha, good. Um, another question asks about the status of the tapes that many women made in the library about their experiences on campus and that they think it was done in conjunction with the Nancy Drew conference. Do you know anything about that at all? We do have uh, some Nancy Drew conference materials in the Nancy Drew collection. We have a lot of Nancy Drew related materials for the people who didn't ask the question because we have the papers of Mildred Wirt Benson, who was the first, the originator of the character. She was the first Carolyn Keene. Um, and so we've had a good relationship with the Nancy Drew sleuths. And um, so I would say, I can't say for sure that we have the tapes in the archives because it, it hasn't, my headspace isn't there. But if we do, then um, yes, they, they will be there and they will be safe and they may be digitized or they are probably on the list to be digitized. Got it. Well, we just, we had another chat that says the tapes were done in the library facility. So I don't know how connected the libraries were, but they were talking, the people were asked to talk about their lives um, as feminists on campus. Mm -hmm. So kind of a definitely an interesting uh, perspective, I'm sure. Yeah, we did something like that for, um, 
the recent Iowa City Feminists reunion that was in 2017. And we had a lot of women who were active in Iowa City in the 1960s through the 80s come in to talk about their stuff. And those are, um, those are digitized. And if you're interested in those kinds of things, you can contact our reference account and we can see about getting access. And so a last question for you is, can the community access the archives? Absolutely, yes. Um, in normal times, you can just walk right in. Um, it's, it's a little more complicated right now with the pandemic, but I would start by sending our reference account, lib-women at uiowa.edu and email, and we will work with you to talk about what you'd like to see, We'll um, make sure that you reserve the boxes that you need and we'll help you schedule an appointment to come into the special collections reading room and use our materials. So yes, absolutely, we're, we're for everybody. Well, that is great now. And I'm gonna ask you if you could put that address into the chat so that people could see that. Sure. And I really wanna thank you for taking the time today, You know, as well as all of the preparation time that you took and kind of bringing this presentation together. There's lots of positive comments in the chat. People have really enjoyed hearing about this. Um, fascinating topic, and it's great to hear about the women who shaped the University of Iowa. So again, to all of our attendees, if you have other questions, please feel free to reach out to Anna. I'm sure she'd be happy to you know, look, look up your question, find those materials, tell you what they have, what they don't have, what they need, what they don't need, et cetera. So um, it's a great resource that we have here at the University of Iowa. And we're just thrilled that we were able to share it with all of you. So just a reminder to all of our attendees that this event, as you know, is recorded. And so at the end of the event, uh, we will be taking that recording, we'll transcribe it, and then we'll be putting it on the college's YouTube page so that you can access the, it later or share it with any friends that might be interested. In addition, after this event, a short survey will pop up for you. We encourage you to just take a few moments and let us know what you thought of our event. Um, and on behalf of the Tippy College of Business, we want to thank you all for attending. Special thanks to Anna for her help in her presentation today. Very positively received. It's been really wonderful. And so we hope you all have a great day. And as always, go Hawks. Thank you, everybody.